Saxologic. Hey. Nathan Graybeal. What's up, man? How you doing? Good, good. Ryan Devlin. Yo. What's up, brother? Dave Pollock, how are you, dude? Yeah, I'm great. What are we doing right now? Dude, we're hanging. We're hanging. We're hanging. Nathan, welcome to The Hang. Dude, thank you. This is The Hang. And this is a special hang episode is... because we're actually in front of a live studio audience. Yeah, at Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music. Shout out in the back. Let's get a woo, woo! in the back. Yeah. Hey. hey. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here at uh, Berkeley College of Music, uh, hanging with Nathan Graybill, Saxologic, who is in town for something. I'll let him explain what that is in a minute. But Mr. Saxologic. For everybody out there who doesn't know you, and I can't imagine that's many people, uh, <laughs> if you had a blank slate to uh, to describe yourself, go for it. Oh, sure. Um, uh, where, where do I even start? Well, first of all, always a pleasure to be in Boston. It's uh, yeah. freezing right now. My bones shrivel on the way here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Is that what happens when you call that's, your bones shrivel? Yeah. I guess so. That's Sweet. bone piercing. But mm. um, So I guess uh, where to start off? Um, I grew up in North Carolina. Um, I was always, I started off, my dream was to be an animator. So I would, you know, just spend like eight hours a day drawing and making comics for my friends. But then um, my brother joined band and he played drums. He seemed like he really enjoyed it. I was like, dude, I want to play drums. I want to have fun. But to play, I had to start off on a woodwind. And I was like, Zach, what did you start off? He said saxophone. I was like, I'll do that. I didn't even really know what a saxophone was. Um, so I just played it and then I fell in love with it and, uh, the school teacher that was there, he wanted me to play drums. All, all of his uh, children played drums. And when it was time to tell him, uh, that I don't want to play drums anymore, he actually got a little mad, I heard, but, um, it all worked out in the end. Um, so now I play saxophone. Originally, I really fell in love with classical saxophone and I actually signed up in my undergrad to just play, to just major in classical saxophone performance. Uh, and then my professor there is like, you know, if, if you just do that, it'll be really hard to find a career. So you should really play both. I was like, okay, I already liked jazz. So I was like, I can, I can do both. But he did warn me that it would be double the schedule. You know, the only way to be good at both genres is, is if you play both genres every day. But I wasn't doing anything else. So I was like, sure. And um, I rose up to the occasion. And then I um, always had a hobby of making YouTube videos. Uh, I mean, you can, if you were to go on my YouTube channel, Saxologic, you'll find all my stuff from when I was 10 years old. Uh, back then, they didn't have likes or dis dislikes. They had uh, stars. So all my stuff, you could rate it out of five. All my stuff were like one star. But it's <laughs> fine. It's fine. I would clap and play on two times speed. But it wasn't until uh, when I got older... And, you know, I had to start working. I My first job was at Cookout. I don't know if, if that's a Boston thing. You guys know of Cookout? More of a Southern thing, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, it's uh, this restaurant where I'd be confined to, like, four uh, square feet of space to flip burgers. <laughs> and I was wow. getting, I was allergic to something. I was coming home with a rash every day. Whoa. And I was like, Dad, is this how life's supposed to be? <laughs> and uh, he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, I was expressing my discontent. And he said, all right, son, if you make one YouTube video a week, I'll let you quit your job. I was like, okay, okay. So I was able to quit the job. And that's when I really started taking it seriously. It was about five years ago now. And um, it was really just throwing paint at the wall. You know, I was making not just saxophone video. My username at the time was Project Idiot. So um, I was trying anything. My My girlfriend at the time, I did her makeup. I was like, boyfriend does girlfriend's makeup. <laughs> I did uh, how to put on your contact lenses. Like I was trying everything. Hello viewers, I'm here to show you how to make a flipbook animation on Snapchat. It's much easier than you think, and it's a great thing to do when you're bored in class. I mean, to pass the time and impress your friends that view your Snapchat story. Let's get started. Wow. <laughs> what year is this? Um, Roughly. I, uh, probably 2019, Man. 2018. Oh, wow. Yep. Not was, that long ago. Yeah, it was about five years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so I was trying, I even, you know, made some animation tutorials. Um, and then the the one thing that really popped off was the Mario Kart League. So I was like, all right, it's actually logic now. I, uh, that username comes from, uh, I used to play Call of Duty on the Wii U. I get roasted for saying I play on the Wii U. But my KD was like 4.76. 
So <laughs> it is Wii U. They're probably like all kids. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, Still counts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my brother's username on it was Drum Logic because his Halo username on uh, Xbox was Snipe Logic. So I was like, naturally, Saxo Logic. And that's how the name Saxo Logic mm. came about. It's really because of Zach, my brother. And um, yeah, once I changed it and the Mario Kart leak. Uh, it's a video I did. It's almost at a uh, 11 million, or I think it is at 11 million views now. And this is b- before the TikTok days, so going viral is a bit more rare. And I feel like everyone's going viral now, which is awesome. You know, this is the digital renaissance for sure. <laughs> That's what I call it. But um, uh, after that, uh, people would write in the comments, "Man, please make more saxophone videos," and I, I found that really encouraging at the time. So I just I just went with the flow, and that's how. It all came to be now. Man. Yeah. That's so cool, dude. Oh, thank you. Behind the scenes, be- the backstory. <laughs> Love it. Oh, thank you. So, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to jump in, but so with, with all that stuff and, and the, you know, the success of being online and being a, a internet personality, if you will, mm-hmm. I know that, you know, from talking to you personally and all this stuff, a lot of it was like overwhelming at first. And I'm sure, like you were just saying, some people now go viral and, <laughs> You know, a lot of people are getting more notoriety online that are younger, especially. Um, how how was that for you? Like mm. people recognizing you and now all of a sudden all these views coming in. And, you know, when you're making a video and you know that, you know, a few people are going to watch it. Now you make a video that potentially millions of people are going to see. Are you are, like, how do you handle that? Because, you know, you think about if you had something in the background that somebody doesn't like and now a million people see it. Mm. It's like, oh, why does he have that? poster <laughs> right. why does he have that you know the thing in the background so like how do you just handle that oh, in general sure. just that overwhelm of going you know way up yeah yeah i'm still trying to figure out that answer whenever i see someone blowing up online uh for example caleb arendo is that his name yeah the guy that does the reverb he's at 600k followers i think congrats and i also think good luck you yeah. know? <laughs> i mean that's a lot of weight on your shoulders and um I'm sure he'll rise up to the occasion. Um, but, you know, now you're really in the public eye. Uh, another thing that's sort of hard to navigate is um, I think when I'm alone in my room, you know, no one's watching. I can really be whatever and not feel like, oh, someone just saw me do that. You know, <laughs> And um, for whatever moment, I can go in the editing room and take out moments I don't want people to see and also have a mic on so I don't have to really – talk that loud but if you meet me in real life i'm i'm pretty shy i've always been that way ever since i was like three i was always a kid in the back with my ds um this is literally <laughs> always and i would bring my it was a pencil case but i would flex it to my nerd friends uh there was like 30 ds games i was like you have this one the mario and bowser luigi edition I was literally that kid. You know, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah yeah um and so uh and then you know sometimes uh, like I did a, a job interview or I don't know if it's a job interview, but I applied for a professorship in Wisconsin and I made it to the final round. And then I think ultimately they, they gave it to the original professor who was going to leave, but, uh, he ended up staying. But, um, I think one of the comments was like, you're not how you are in your videos. And I wasn't sure to whether to be insulted by that or not, but I don't really know because I, I don't want to be like, hey, guys, you know, just all the time. I feel like that would be a lot. But for in a YouTube video, I need that because I'm just like, hey, uh, we're going to unbox some reads. It's just too boring. No one wants to watch that. I I was a YouTube consumer uh, long before I took uh, YouTube seriously. So I have a good idea of what I like to watch. So I try to replicate my videos based off of what would younger me would have really appreciated. Because, I mean, I was in a YouTube rabbit hole. At one point, I really think I saw every saxophone video on YouTube. Now, it's impossible. There's so many now. But um, I just remember thinking so many times, like, ah, oh, I wish someone just taught about this or someone talked about this. And when I went to school, I was getting all this knowledge. I was like, this is exactly the knowledge that I was looking for when I was in high school. And I didn't have uh, a teacher uh, in high school. I think I tried one. But it wasn't very great. He had a very, very buzzy sound, and I was playing furling etudes on classical. <laughs> but um, that's a whole nother story. But um, yeah, like I said, digital renaissance, and you know, navigating everything. It's, it's certainly still 
um, a tricky thing. Like you said, if there's something something on your poster that, you know, you might get you canceled, maybe it's like a, a political opinion, you know. That's something you have to be really conscious of. Um, I remember I posted some political opinion on Instagram, and like 50% of people were like, how dare you, blah, blah. I was like, whoa, what's going on? So that's certainly something, you know, to be so uh, pretty conscious of. And I would say that's one of the um, the benefits of not uh, going viral or people not knowing you. I feel like, uh, if anything, you can really be more yourself. You, you have less to lose. I, I feel like there's a lot of fun. I wish I could go back to that sometimes, you know. Um, but, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a good yeah, I, I I have a question that I'm interested, like with the social media age that we're in and everything, like people posting like one minute videos of, of their gig or like a teaching thing and then they pop off really fast. Mm. And then, you know, like versus seeing somebody live play a show, mm. you know, I feel like a lot of people that take this seriously and are trying to be professionals are like, the show is more important than the Instagram, like the Instagram or whatever's like a highlight reel. Mm. But I feel like now it's so easy for people to go viral just by having like one thing, like clip, you know? Mm. But like, it's interesting how, how like I want to know your, your opinion on like people that consume it, especially like younger, mm. younger audiences, like high school, middle school, stuff like that, where they see this one thing that mm. looks really great and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to idolize this person, which is cool. But then like, you know, that person isn't maybe like, a great role model in other aspects. You know what I mean? Like, it's like interesting to see how people can be like partly on, you know, like the highlight reels, Mm. you know, everybody's got like that one minute clip. That's like, this is my best stuff, you know, but then like also navigating and seeing like what the person offered is like fully, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's a really great question, but no, no, I see what you mean. Yeah. I have a few thoughts on that. Um, I think as one, I think as time goes on and on, I think it will become so oversaturated. Yeah. Ultimately, the digital world probably will reflect more and more of the real world. Yeah. Um, that's one. Uh, two, I think not all views are created equal. Right. Um, I don't know if that's like a Yoda saying. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Oh, okay. um, so, for example, uh, my brother, Zach, um, he was walking with someone at NAM with 2 million TikTok followers. And Zach at the time had 300,000 YouTube followers. And... As, he, as they were walking together, and no one knew who she, who she was, and everyone was asking him for an autograph. So I, right. I do think there's something about the nature of scrolling that it, it's really forgettable. You'll laugh 100%. and chuckle. We were talking about that 100%. yesterday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Long form content, or longer form. Nowadays, 10 minutes is considered long form content. Yeah. Mm. In which, really, long form content, I would think it'd be more like this, like a podcast. But when you think about like a Casey Neistat video, Mm. Um, you know, you talk about eight to 15 minute, like mini movies, mm. you get way more invested that than a one minute clip on Instagram that you're not even going to finish. Like you hear the first couple seconds, yeah. flip through, flip through. Now, mm. I mean, YouTube tries to do that with the shorts, but if you sit down and watch a Saxologic video, mm. you know, either on the computer, on your phone or whatever, it's like you're consuming this thing. You're watching this mm. product versus, oh, there's a clip on Instagram from the gig last night, which is cool. Oh, there's a little funny joke okay cool cool but there's there's not you don't dive into it as deep yeah so and because i think so many people do that you don't develop any sort of like association with the person or you don't really know much shallow it's very shallow that's what i'm saying so you can go to this person this person this person it might they might all be great but like you said they're kind of forgettable Mm -hmm. or whatever but if i sit down and watch a 12 minute video even if it is like a joke video or you know like a, a jazz snob video or it's or it's an unboxing video either way i'm you're taking us through like a more yeah. of a story arc. There's no story arc in a one minute for yeah. the most part. There, some people can do it, but sure. in a one minute clip, it's just kind of. But it's also like like through. the I mean on analytics on Instagram, like the average watch time of a video is like less than twenty seconds. No. you know what I mean. It's oh, like, yeah. and so I found like there's certain ways to post on Instagram where they'll get more views because like the first fifteen seconds of whatever I'm posting is is watch like people want to watch it or whatever. And then, but if I post like a full solo, no one's going to view it. You know, it's like interesting. And, and I feel like because of that, it makes people like become more shallow at this music because Mm. they're not worried about playing a whole solo. They're worried about the clip. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when I first, I'll be honest, like when I first started doing the Instagram thing, I was the same way. Mm. Like I all, every time I would play a gig, I'd try and get that like really great clip of me playing something. I still am that way. Oh, well, I mean, but you're all, I mean, I saw, we saw your show last night. You played fantastic all, all the way around, you know? Yeah. And 
but like I remember I had some mentors come up to me and be like, man, your playing is very shallow because of that. You know, because I was honest with them. I was like, well, I'm just kind of trying to like hmm. make a highlight for my Instagram. You know, I, I value that really a, a lot. And he was like, if you want to be a professional musician at this art and be serving the music, you can't think about that. Mm. He's like, you need to f you need to play your thing. And if the video that you get is that video that you want to post, cool. But like, don't worry about sure. just being killing on that one minute. And know? the same thing goes. Remember, we were talking actually yesterday about uh, albums. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> if if you always try to make every individual song like the absolute banger, craziest song ever, you end up with a collection of songs that wouldn't fit together as an album. Right. Mm. When in, in, in the before times, people would buy a CD or buy an album, listen to it from beginning to end. Not every song is going to be, you know, yeah, there's, sure. there's going to be an actual arc to the entire album. So, but if you took out one of those songs in the middle, you might go, oh, they're playing is boring. They're yeah. just like, mm. it's oh, like this yeah. slow yeah. thing. But in context of the entire album, you know, it's there. And then, and that's like a really big one. And then if you take one solo and then take a clip from the solo, now we're really getting down to the micro. Yeah. And then it's this thing of, you know, like you said, highlight reel, highlight, highlight reel over and over and over again. And then you go see a show maybe. Some people might only, almost be disappointed sometimes yeah. because you actually use musicality instead of just, I want to hear the fastest, highest notes yeah. from beginning to end. Right. And it's like, that's not going to be the most musically uh, appropriate thing. Sure. It, but, and it's not. But like when you hear like, like I've watched full clips of, you know, like Eric Alexander or, mm. or people that, you know, like full and, and their whole solo is like a highlight reel because they yeah. care about the whole solo. Like it's an yeah. arc, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So whatever their PR person posts on Instagram, it's going to be killing. So like yeah. when I started thinking about that of like, it doesn't matter about the one minute or whatever. I'm just going to play. I'm going to serve the music. I'm going to play my yeah, best. Yeah, don't and then, phone in the first two courses as practice and then go, oh, yeah, yeah. third course, okay, I'm here I go. for Instagram. Or like when I go drums <laughs> and tenor, like that's <laughs> like, when I'll bring like, all my all right, cool I'll, stuff. I'll, yeah. like, I'll just get warm. Okay, now I'm going to yeah, take right, it serious. Right, which is shout. And then, no, yeah. you know, people don't want to play with you because it's just all yeah. about the one minute clip. You know what I mean? It's just True. an interesting yeah. thing how, like growing up, like seeing people on Instagram pop off, I was like, okay, that's all I need to learn how to do is like one minute of shredding and then... Doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't even know how to play a ballad. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it doesn't matter. But yeah. yeah, at the same time, I sort of see the function in all of it. You know, I think, um, I mean, certainly in terms of uh, getting sales with jazz lesson videos, I, I do find if you do the shallow sort of thing for yeah. the intro, right. it does generate way more sales than totally. something really musical. But, you know, as like you said, if that's all you're doing in a like a longer concert, people are going to check out very early. Um, and yeah, to, to make it on Instagram right now, I don't currently really, uh, take Instagram super seriously. Um, I just find that all the sort of pulling power and monetary wise really comes from YouTube. Totally. And I think right now you can't even monetize Instagram. Um, so it's just a priority thing right now for me because there's only so much hours in the day, yeah. but, um, you know, certainly I, I think if I were to take Instagram seriously, I, it does make sense to do the, that sort of thing, as long as you can do it all, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of playing a long concert, you know, or like, as we we're saying, uh, when, 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 when we read a book, you know, the, the, the impact of a really good book, it really sticks with you forever. And um, me and Adam Neely were talking about yesterday. I mean, there's just some YouTube channels when they upload, even if they go months without uploading it, when they upload, it just feels like an event. Yeah. And, you know, you can grab, you know, some popcorn or something or some food and get ready and you just stick through it like it's a movie, you know. Mm. And, I mean, Adams are like that. Yeah. yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Especially uh -huh. now that he has a, a regular upload schedule, too. Mm -hmm. I'm just like waiting for the next one. Yeah. And, you know, he really takes you through. A whole thing and you feel like you got something out of it yeah it feels like a simulation or something <laughs> <laughs> and you learn yeah like you said you like actually you learn, learn stuff which is really great you know mm. i think switching a little bit i just just curious you know we could talk about straight up youtube stuff all day but transitioning more now into you know because there's a lot of people who just exist online mm. and everything you see is online everything is there and then you look to see if they're playing somewhere and nowhere to be found mm. you now i've been touring you've been playing a bunch mm. so how has that been um, and I want you to, I guess, talk about the band that you're playing with now oh, with sure. your brother and just how that's been and how that maybe how that came to be and just everything with now the performing aspect live out there. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, there's a there's a lot to it. Um, so I guess to start off, I'm in a band that my brother and his friend Sean Reeser started uh, entitled, or the band is called Everything Yes. And the idea behind that name is anyone that's in the band 
if you have a song idea, uh, you don't even have to ask uh, if we're going to try it out. We're just going to say yes. We'll say yes to everything. So everything, yes. That's, That's awesome. Of, yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. And um, our bass player, they also started it with him too. Uh, Sean, our tenor sax player and composer of the majority of the songs, and Cole, they grew up together in Pennsylvania. And uh, me and them and Zach all went to the same undergrad, East Carolina University, and um, lots of adventures. And so we're all super close in that way. And we all, especially my brother, prioritize the hang over over all else. You know, sure, we could get uh, the most crazy blazing uh, bebop player in the universe. But we'd rather just, you know, stick to someone we're really close with. Because I think ultimately the music is funner for everyone in the room um, when, when the closest is there. But um, really, I really think all this came full circle. So um, when I always growing up, Zach was a very in-demand musician. He's very dedicated uh, to the drums very early. And he's always been... Uh, very selective of his time. He, he's never like a party type um, and never did things that would... He would always stick to the same thing. So he, it, would, it was either drums or a halo and nothing else. Now it's Apex. But he... he Not he, the gym? Uh, gym as well, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, gym as well. He looks like God. Hercules, bro. Like when we met... I, I've never met him in person before. Holy crap. <laughs> Bro. I'm stronger than him. But, uh, I, I know, yeah, but you know, no, he's, no. He's, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, we used to fight all the time, but after he got big, I don't want to fight him anymore. <laughs> uh, he would destroy me. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry to derail that a little all, bit. No. All good. But um, so it, it really came full circle. So as he was doing that, I was really into nerdy uh, video gaming stuff, and he was he was drumming, he was gigging everywhere. Um, I was. I was, you know, playing a lot of classical saxophone, dabbling in jazz, and really just um, getting into YouTube and all that stuff. And so when the Mario Kart like went viral, Zach was about to do a cruise ship gig in, um, I think, Asia. So he w- he was killing it in terms of that. And then COVID happened, so that was canceled. And then my YouTube channel was really doing well. And then... Um, my parents were sort of putting the pressure on Zach. They're like, Nathan, or sorry, Zach, why is Nathan doing so well here? Uh, you need to figure out something to do. And it, it created some discomfort for him. But ultimately, I gave him just a few, uh, I guess, guidelines. I don't know the right word. Just a few tips on how to get a YouTube channel started. And I'm sure all of you know, sometimes, you know, you can shout someone out or you can... Um, help someone make a video, but ultimately it really is all on them. You know, I have like 200,000 su- subscribers. Sometimes I'll shout someone out and maybe they'll get four subscribers from it. You know, so I really can't take uh, the credit for Zach's success. But at the time, I didn't understand that. And so um, after after a year, he ended up doubling my subscribers. And that that really made me jealous for a bit. I was like, how, how is this possible? And um, uh, he had said to me, he was like, you just need to get funnier. And <laughs> I, I know. And so I was going to say, because there's way more drummers in the world than saxophone mm, players. Oh, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's probably the more objective. But, you know, Zach's a big brother. So he, and so I took that as like an attack. And I was like, how dare you not be grateful for the help I have invested into you? You know? <laughs> um, um, but, you know, my dad was like, man, just see it as a good thing. You know, would you rather this not have happened? And now fast forward later, Zach is a very successful world world touring musician, and he brings me along in his band. So I think everything worked out in the end. Full circle. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a long story. <laughs> How long have you guys been on tour like this this tour mm-hmm. so far? Um, so this was our fifth show. We okay. started on the 16th. Nice. Yeah, it's been awesome. I lost my relationship already. Darn it. I don't know if we want to put that in the podcast. <laughs> oh, That's man. That's okay. Because of the tour? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Everyone, it, yeah. Ooh, man. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. We, yeah. It's okay. I mean, I tried my best. but It's uh, tough, man. Long distance is tough. It's not for everyone, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Definitely not. No. We yeah. got lucky. <laughs> yeah. I'm also not out there touring That's much. true. You know, I'm not away yeah. too much. 
Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, the life side of it's, is tough. You know, when, when kids ask me, should I go to school for music or should I do this? Should I do that? You know, there, there's more options. And I think it's good now with social media, you can see what the options are. You know, I always bring back to the point that not to like joke about being older or whatever, but like when I graduated high school, Instagram, YouTube, and even Facebook didn't exist yet. Mm. So I didn't know, I didn't know like people in college. I didn't know other high schoolers that were great. I only know people in my yeah. literal, like oh, in yeah. real world. There was MySpace guys. Mm. There was MySpace. Oh, and yeah. nobody was like <laughs> posting videos online like that. So that wasn't a thing. So I, I think it's a good thing in that now people can see that. Because when I was, I, when I was coming up, when they were like, you want to go to school for jazz, it's okay, you're going to play in jazz clubs around the world or something. And it, that's it. Like, that's what you right. do. If you're going to school to perform, that's what yeah. you're doing. But now there's there's so many, I mean, there's there were other options back then, but they were not, you didn't really talk about them. It was, oh, you're going to school for music. That means you're going to try to, you know, email a place and try to play at, you know, the jazz standard. Or you're going to try to get picked up by a, a touring big band or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But now, you know, people see that there's so many different avenues, I think, in music. So people can kind of almost like people talk about overwhelm and like, why should I get into an industry where there's too many? And I think overwhelm, there's when there's overwhelm, there's opportunity, because if there's overwhelm, that means there's got to be some demand for it. Mm -hmm. So you just have to stand out in a certain way. So even though, you know, mm -hmm. it's a crowded niche mm -hmm. on YouTube of saxophone. You stood out in a way. Zach stood out in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but even performing, when we talk about the tough life of touring, you can be a professional musician and not tour. You can be a yeah. professional musician, musician only tour. Mm -hmm. But it's all pieces. And I think mm -hmm. it's cool to see that you're, and a lot of other people, including Ryan, plays. you play a lot of you know shows and you're touring all around, but you're also doing YouTube stuff. You're also you know, writing eBooks and you're writing exercises. You have courses or you work with this. It's all pieces of it. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of different things. I think um, Kevin from Jazz Memes posted a little while back and got me into some hot water with some people. But they were like, how is the jazz world, how is the jazz scene now, or, or how is the world now for jazz musicians? And I, and everybody was like, it's terrible. It's just, mm -hmm. everything's dying. And I said, I said, for performing, it's worse than ever, but for, mu for music, it's better than ever. And my point is there's so many different avenues than just getting on stage. Getting on stage is great. And, and I'm always lucky and I feel privileged every time I get on stage. But and not entitled, and that's another. We'll get into that. But um, can't wait for that one. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's so many things out there. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing now, people see you touring. If they don't know anything else about you, they might think that your only thing in music is you're yeah. touring around the world, right? Right. So they think of you as that. And and even like people like Chris Potter, I don't know, Vincent Herring, Jerry Bagonzi, they see them only and they think of them only as musicians. But what are they doing? Oh, dude, they're they're teaching. They're writing they're doing Dude. all these different mm -hmm. things and now yeah. with social media there's so many different options mm -hmm. so i know that i'm not really asking a question or anything i'm just commenting on the state of music that you know you're touring around you're playing all these gigs but it's it's a piece of the overall like mm -hmm. you as a musician as a um person in the music business not mm -hmm. just musician yeah mm -hmm. you know because if you make a, a video on whatever that's still in the music space but not necessarily like you're playing a show dude sure. like like i uh yeah, I, I think, and that's another thing with the Instagram, like highlight reel, is people like that follow you on Instagram or YouTube only see you doing that, right? Yeah. So like, you know, I'm sure people don't even know that Jerry Berganzi teaches at New England Conservatory, especially if they only see him on YouTube mm -hmm. playing in Europe and, you know, like all these different places. It's like crazy. And like when I first started touring with my own band, I had a, a drummer in the band that I knew, but not super personally. He was doing a couple tours with me and stuff. And he thought I was hiding money from him <laughs> because... Uh, like, you know, he would see, like, I, I got some sponsorships or whatever online, and he thought, he didn't know, you know, that, like, a sponsorship from a, a company can be, like, you know, a, a couple hundred dollars for a video or whatever, and he, so, and he thought when we were booking these shows, I was getting those sponsorships to, like, pay for the rooms and the Airbnb. I was doing it all out of pocket, oh. and so he was, like, asking for more money on some of these gigs, and I'm like, bro, I'm being completely transparent with you, like, this is what I can offer, I'm paying you out of pocket because we're losing money on these gigs. You know, I'm trying to tour for the first time. And we he ended up, like, I fired him because wow. he was, like, coming at me, like, thinking I was hiding money from him and, like, you know. Ooh. And it was just because he didn't know me. You know what I mean? Do I know this guy? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, he would go unnamed. And the thing is, now, like, uh, he's one of my friends. Like, we're friends now because mm -hmm. we talked it out and everything was cool. But at that time, it was, like, really, like, touch and go because he thought I was, like, being, you know, kind of he, he's just he just saw the instagram thing or he just saw 
like what I was doing outside of like being a, a manager of the band too. And, you know, like I was paying for all of our Airbnbs. I was paying for gas on the, you know, t- plane tickets, all this stuff. Like, I think people don't realize that when it, you're, it's your band, if you don't have like a, you know, a management system or an agency, like you're doing it all out of pocket, yeah, true. you know? Definitely. And uh, I think it, like the Instagram thing can seem like a facade a little bit, mm. you know, oh, with yeah. like, oh, yeah. You know what you decide to post is what people see that you do. You know yeah. what I mean. So if you if you you know if you have a day job but you don't post it, you know people just think that you're a touring saxophone player. People, but I meet know. people sometimes who have no idea. I, I I'm a teacher. Yeah, like a pub. Mm. I've been a public school teacher for 14 years. Yeah, people have no idea. Exactly. And, and I I kind of do that on purpose. Right. Because mm. because if I go to a gig and people hear that oh there's a public school teacher <laughs> playing, they're gonna be like oh he can't play. Right. And like I want you to think I can't play because I just can't play. <laughs> don't think I can't play before I show up because oh, I'm a teacher. Yeah. There's some <laughs> teachers that are actually good. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's just interesting how like <laughs> it's just interesting how it's like people only see what what you post and and what you put out there, which is a blessing and a curse no. because you know they don't always see the 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 back end of what you're putting, you know, like what you're investing in. Like I, I remember I had a teacher in in college that says you need a you need a career to support your jazz habit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like to yeah. be to be a professional jazz musician, like you need something else to help, and that could be like what you're saying, like education, you know, like working for jazz lesson videos. Or, you know, working at a school, you know, like I teach at a public school here in Boston. A lot of people know that I, I don't post about it often, but like that's part of my income, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and it allows me to still tour and stuff because I have a flexible schedule. But I, I also work for jazz lesson videos, mm-hmm. you know, so it's like all these different things. There's like a part of what being a professional yeah, musician. Is. I think that's it. It's I think it's more a part of it versus you need this separate job to right. support this. I mean, yeah, sure. If it's not related at all, if you're an accountant during the day to play, that's, but like being a music teacher, I don't think is a separate thing in my, like it all, it helps me. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. able to do these things, not like monetarily, but just, just, I learn things from this that I can apply. And I mm-hmm. think that's important for everybody. Um, especially you guys here, if you're, you're trying to go in different things, don't think of like, Oh, I have to get through this lesson and whatever, then I'll forget about it. Then I can go play the gig. Well, what can you learn in that lesson? Like I learn a lot of stuff by teaching other people. Yeah. I remember like the way I learned the way I, like the way I teach something. Sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That's the way I used to think about it. Maybe I should start, go back to that. Cause you can only, you know, you only have certain bandwidth. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but it's all part of it. Like you said, like, you know, for someone who's like a musician nowadays, you're not, except for the extreme, extreme, uh, small percentage, you're not only a musician you're a musician but that includes a lot of these other things and they're i don't think they're separate i think they are kind of combined yeah yeah speak yeah. well sorry you want to say this, but i was gonna say speaking oh. of that i would love the transition to hear about the the jazz lesson video thing oh yeah mr ceo over here <laughs> oh, it still feels weird to, <laughs> <laughs> to hear it like that yeah 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 well i was just going to say that um i've always felt like you know people break their backs to make buildings or, you know, work these 12-hour jobs, or I, I heard a quote, it said, life takes from takers, but life gives to givers. And I just think, no matter what, I, th- I think a lot of people, they sort of have this dream, like, if I do music, all I will do is just play and make money for it. But um, I, I, I just don't think it works like that. It doesn't work like that for anyone, and so why should it work like that for us too? No matter what, we have to hustle. It's just hard work is at the bedrock of it all. That's how I sort of feel about that. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, like your friend, this sort of entitlement, like he should have your money just because he plays. Right. To me, that just it gives me a, re- a repulsion. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, why? You know? Yeah. People work 10 times harder and make way less. So totally. why should we, you know, that's sort of how I feel about that. But. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And Luckily, we're cool now, him and I. But like, oh, okay. but at first, I was like, I called every one of the members in my band, and I was like, "Do you guys feel this way? Like, do you think mm. I'm like hiding?" And they all were like, "No, no, no, we understand." You know, mm. and so I think he just didn't know me for me. You know what I mean? He maybe mm. he didn't, but anyway. But yeah, yeah, it was. It's interesting. It's an interesting kind of dynamic with social media and all that stuff. But mm. yeah, let's talk about well, jazz. Lesson yeah, video. one more thing sure. before jazz lesson videos too. The the there is a doom and gloom that a lot of people post-college older especially give to college age kids about like you can't make any money doing this can't do this right it also depends on what lifestyle you want yeah because and that was that was one of the biggest things for me and still is the biggest thing for me like i have and we'll talk about it later hobbies outside of like for me and it and it and this might be offensive to some uh 
jazz people especially because I listen I have the utmost respect for jazz for the music and people have died for this music like we talk about mm -hmm. but my life isn't music mm -hmm. music is what everybody thinks my life is because that's what they see online I don't post about my life online right right things mm -hmm. I actually do in my day-to-day -day life and things I love the most like my family my wife my pets and all that I don't post that online anywhere yeah mm -hmm. because that's like for me I just keep that if you saw Saving Private Ryan when they were talking to Tom Hanks and he was like, can you tell me about your wife back home? Tell me about that memory you have. He's like, no, that's just for me. Yeah. Like, right. that's how I kind of feel because, mm -hmm. so the reason why I bring this up is I had friends in college, like I'm sure a lot of people have that, like they wanted to live that starving artist lifestyle. They wanted to grind and hustle mm -hmm. and have to eat only ramen noodles, you know, every day and live with like six other people in a one bedroom apartment. They want, they like, they mm -hmm. like uh, had that, um, what do you call that? Like that, rom they romanticize that struggle. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. And that's the thing. Like, I just knew that for me personally, I wanted a different path. Mm. Not to say that, like, that's the only reason I'm not playing at the Vanguard every night is because I chose <laughs> not to. No, <laughs> but but yeah. you know what I mean? But like, sure, so sure. Yeah. when we talk about making money in this stuff, it doesn't mean everybody has to have nine jobs and try to make, you know, sure. six figures or, or beyond. Mm. It just means that, you know, there there are options available to you if you wish to get there, I guess. Is, yeah. That's yeah. the only thing I wanted to add to that. Absolutely. So, it's a great point. So speaking of making millions of dollars, jazz lesson videos. <laughs> I do not. I don't make millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so so how'd that come about and how long? I mean, you know, so how long have you known Chad? Obviously prior to being yeah. the CEO of the company, but how long, uh, you know, how'd that all come about? Yeah. So I started off uh, in undergrad as a Chad fanboy, as most undergrad people are oh, yeah. <laughs> especially at that time um and one one day i asked him if he wanted a collab but uh you know he's a full-blown professional and he had charge of fee and i i was like no one knew who i was and i there's no way i could afford that fee i was like uh oh, okay never mind <laughs> i didn't say that but um but then later uh he had noticed and then he offered to fly me out to collab together um i was like whoa and I showed all my undergrad friends, like, look, look, look. And it was like, it didn't feel real. So he flew me out to New York. It was my first time in New York. And, you know, he has this beautiful living space. And, again, it just felt like a dream. And we made two videos. They did really, really well. And he offered um, to work together on a more regular basis. But I couldn't do it at the time because I was, I think I was in the thick of it with my senior recital and all that stuff. Um, and then the offer came a few more times, but I was just in the thick of it with school again. But, um, uh, in the summer of, after my first year of my DMA in classical saxophone, um, it was like perfect timing. Uh, his prior CEO, his previous CEO, uh, was moving on to a more freelance thing. And so the position opened up, uh, his CEO position and, uh, Chad called me and asked if I wanted it. And at the time, I was sort of going through all kinds of existential stuff in my head about uh, classical DMA school. Um, like one of the things um, was I had this idea that I'm just do my DMA early while I'm young before I have kids or anything. And then I'll take like five years to sort of like live the life that I do now and um, maybe accept any cool offers. And then I'll be a professor. Um, but, you know, I told my professor there, and he said, if you do that, it'll be next to impossible to find a job in uh, academia because they're going to see this big gaping hole uh, in your resume of, like, not doing anything academic-related. So that at that moment, I was like, oh, I just signed my whole life away, like, already. And um, I was already, you know, I've been in school my whole life, and, you know, I was... I really wanted to taste what is it like to not be in school. At first, I loved school. You know, it was. I would recommend anyone that wants to do music school to definitely do it. It was, especially my undergrad. It was the best years of my life for sure. Um, but then after a while, for me, and not everyone's gonna feel this way. But for me, it started to feel like a prison cell. I was like, oh no, not another essay, not mm. another. And I, it just started uh, driving me crazy. Um, so when this when this offer from Chad came by um not only did it seem like an escape it was also just an amazing offer and um it also seemed like a really great opportunity to learn more deeply from chad um, not just from a music perspective but also from a, a mentor perspective as a businessman 
And I mean, already the, the art of sales is totally different than anything I've ever done. Um, mm. Like you can, you can have a video uh, that gets 300,000 views, like a YouTube video. And the thing you're trying to sell gets like a hundred sales. But some of these techniques from Chad, you can have a video with 10,000 views, but it gets like 3,000 sales, you know, and it's totally different techniques. And I'm still learning it. I'm, I'm not the most natural at it, but Chad is a master, you know, so I'm, I'm learning as much as I can from And he's also just uh, an amazing human being. He's, he's such a caring man. He's always, he's very hospitable. Hospital, I can't hospital, ah. hospitable. Ah, there, there we go. Third hospital. time's the charm. Yeah. Sense. <laughs> He's a hospital. Yeah. He is. You know, I hope everyone can meet him. He's one of the nicest dudes I ever met. And um, I was supposed to move in New York by then so that we could work together. But setback after setback. Um, last time I was there, I found a place. The guy was like, "Oh yeah, this is all yours." And um, uh, I said, "Can I practice here?" And he was like, yes, yes, this is a great practice place. I was like, amazing. And so he, it was a broker. He he runs it back to his landlord. And I had already signed everything. I stopped looking. And I even told the other choices. I was like, okay, I already found the place. But they were like, oh, the landlord heard you're a saxophonist. They don't want you anymore. I was like, oh. They said their last uh, resident had too many noise complaints because he was a, a guitarist. <laughs> so I just felt like I got Damn. juked there. But that's okay. Um, but in uh, my lease in Memphis officially ends in Ju- July 11th. So I will have to move by then or I'll literally be homeless or live <laughs> with my parents. But I don't want to do that again. I love my parents, but I don't want to do that to them. They have a, enough on their hands. <laughs> is, is Zach going to be staying down there? Uh, moving? Zach wants to move to Nashville. Oh. Oh, nice. he, he wouldn't move with me, but it seems like uh, the drumming situation in New York. Uh, it's, it's a little difficult, especially if you're trying to film videos. And stuff. Right, mm. right. Yeah, Nashville's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and it's pretty close, and it's uh, a lot cheaper too for a lot bigger space. Oh yeah, and, you know, yeah. And uh, even when I was moving to New York, <laughs> or moving, when I was visiting, I was like, yeah, I'm looking to move here. The hotel guy he was like, where are you from? I said Tennessee. He was like, well, everyone's moving from New York to Nashville. <laughs> I was like, wow. Here I am. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I forgot what question went on. It was just no, just about jazz lesson videos. Oh, okay. But yeah, awesome. that's that's interesting, man. Yeah, Chad is is a great guy and has given a lot of people a lot of opportunities. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. I got to study with him for three years before he was what he is now. You know, he was he was pretty famous, you know, on social media and stuff. But he had no jazz lesson videos. Like, mm-hmm. my lessons with him, he was like writing those PDFs. Mm. Like, and he, I remember him telling me in lessons, like, yeah, I got this guy that's, like, helping me out, like, sort all these lines through, you know, we're, like, working really hard to get all these things out. And I was like, oh, cool, I didn't know what it was going to be. And, yeah. and now it's, like, especially during the pandemic, it just popped off, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. It's pretty pretty insane. Yeah, absolutely. But I got something here. Yeah. So we got to get into a little segment we love to do <laughs> is uh, about the performing aspect of things. Okay, so we like to, to ask people what their worst gig story is, either most embarrassing or like craziest situation or something went wrong, just like worst gig experience. It could just be like, yeah, something related to just sure. bad, a bad gig. Sure. Um, maybe it's bad uh, to me personally, and you can withhold yeah. names if you want. Yeah, oh, okay. or you can tell them. <laughs> all yeah, that. all good. Screw it. <laughs> all good. Uh, one time I had to do a tenor sax gig, and man, they they get down. It was a crazy wedding, and um, but uh, out of nowhere they're like tenor sax solo, and they they made me dance, and I'm not a dancing type. It was just really really awkward. It was oh god, just thinking about it, I get shivers. Was there <laughs> it, any video? Uh, I I don't have it. Okay, I hope Ooh, there's. We gotta go find, find this. <laughs> Everybody find post it, their we'll wedding ins- video. We'll insert it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just everyone looking at me, and oh, God, I think oh, every horrible gig story that we've said all revolves around either a corporate band or a wedding band. You notice that? Yeah. Every it's because, single one. It's because I think we, as jazz <laughs> musicians, we don't prepare ourselves as seriously for these wedding gigs and corporate mm. gigs as we do other things. That's, I think that's the 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 theme. But you didn't know you were gonna dance. I did not. Maybe no. you could have practiced if you knew. Yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you little Do you hip- remember what song it was? 
Um, no, I, I don't know. It was Man, a top forty song. Okay. Yeah. Man, Chad's got those hips when he plays. You can always ask <laughs> oh, yeah, him. Bro, he's a mess. Just a little two step. That's all you need. Oh yeah. But he's yeah. got like the <laughs> circular hip thing. You ever yeah. seen these videos? <laughs> yes, Dude. I have. I like tell my wife not to watch them. I'm like, hey, 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 hey. whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, Ooh, who's that? <laughs> He's like way taller than you too, <laughs> and has so much more money. <laughs> and he can swivel his hips. Oh, and you hear that tritone sub he just played? Yeah, oh boy. yeah. <laughs> Riley loves the tritone subs. Yep. <laughs> so that's good. Any others? You got any more? I want to oh, hear some more. Um, because uh, honest, because that's not that bad. That's oh, not okay. that bad. It's no. really not. You didn't oh, okay. ruin anybody's wedding. Like we Ryan have, did. we have really embarrassed. Yeah, okay. we didn't do that. Yeah. You know. So come on, you got something I guess, else? I guess I don't have anything out of this world. Uh, maybe. Not too long ago, my Nexus dropped on the stand, and everyone saw it. That was pretty, oh. Im- pretty embarrassing. I still mm. have the dent. Nice. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's yeah. okay. Yeah, but at least, at least it wasn't the Mark Six. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope Jack's not <laughs> watching. <laughs> nah, he's not gonna watch this. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Shout out Jack. We love Jack Tyler. Boston Tax. He's Shop. a sponsor. By of this. the way, yeah, we want to thank a few people. I mean, yeah. obviously Nathan. This isn't the end, but this is Boston Tax Shop for sponsoring the podcast. I mean, we're not in Boston Tax Shop today, but we're in Boston. But we are in Boston, and and Jack is a great friend of the show, and yes, and a friend of us. So Boston Tax yeah. Shop, everybody, and Leatherback Roasters for the Wrong Notes Ooh. Only Coffee Blend. Uh, they sponsor our podcast, and they fuel us with lots of wrong notes. They fuel us uh, with <clears throat> yeah. tasting notes of dark chocolate, caramelized apple. Wow. There we go. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we gotta, really we're cool gonna do shit. a. Pi- I, I, I want to do a podcast them. at their roastery. Yes. in Florida. That'd Absolutely, be killing. that'd be sweet. We'll just be drinking hella coffee. Yes, I'm <laughs> that'd down. Be crazy. So Nathan, we, we touched on a little before. Um, you know, people know you as a musician. You know, a YouTuber. Uh, you know, all this stuff. Teacher, educator. What, what do you enjoy, if you don't mind, outside of music? Hmm. Um, I believe balance is super important. Sure. Um, and I know you talked about a little before about writing or video games mm-hmm. and drawing and stuff. But like, what, what do you enjoy now? And I know you might not be as into it right now because of being busy and stuff. But like, what mm-hmm. are those things that you like to do that are, you know, not practicing your instrument, not recording videos? Sure, sure. Um, so this one... Uh, it's just an age old one for me. I still play Super Smash Brothers whenever I can. I love that game. It's how I blow off some steam. Yeah. You know, um, it, if I can, I, I'll go to a tournament. It's a nice way to meet friends from a, a different crowd. Yeah. Um, I'm also pretty into reading now. I, I've always hated reading, but after school, you can be a, a lot more selective with what <laughs> you read and the information you seek. Sometimes even a YouTube video is not enough. And so you're like, let me just read about it. And so I'm really into reading. I'm reading one about the the greatest samurai to ever live, uh, Musashi. Is that his Whoa, name? Cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty killing. Yeah. I actually tried some of his mental techniques uh, yesterday during my solos. You know, Whoa, he sounded great. So I think yeah, it worked. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's another one. I also enjoy just being in the sun more because you know being inside on the computer all day can be pretty draining mm-hmm. um so just seeing the sun i like just strolling in the park honestly maybe a boring answer but no, that's great i'm pretty casual man i'd say <laughs> we interviewed mike tucker great oh, yeah. saxophone player who oh, plays with arturo sandoval and he said his hobby was hiking he oh, just nice. loves to be outside and go hiking oh amazing. You know? yeah so the nature aspect yeah so big like golf mm-hmm. Oh, oh yeah, dude! We should go golfing someday. I'm down. Yeah, that'd be killing. Oh, what if? Oh man, the three of us and your dad. Oh, dude, my dad or, would have a field or day. Or the three of us and Kenny G. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, even better. Yeah, <laughs> we should make that happen. <laughs> that'd be crazy. that'd be crazy. My dad still almost <laughs> once a week goes. Have you talked to Saxologic recently? Oh, no. He loves you. Oh, <laughs> dude, I love him. And people, so he does these <laughs> clinics at at Disney World, and people come up to him and be like, "I know you from that Saxologic video." Oh, like, really? yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's, Shout out to Daddy oh, Devlin. Yeah, we got to get him on the podcast, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. He the loves man you, himself. Every time you post something, he sends it to me. Does he actually? He, I love it. I'm like, there he goes. Oh there he God. goes again. I mean, I don't mind. I got to talk to him about that. <laughs> he does. He was also on the live stream for the Global Jazz Workshop. 
and he like posted. He was like, "Hi, Chad. It's da- it's Father Devlin." And then I think Chad said hello. And then right under, he goes, "Have you tried Ryan's coffee yet?" And I was like, "Dad, come on, man. Like Dude, you got to out, man." Yeah, I know, but like it's a little Promoting. embarrassing. Oh, no, that's, that's great. That's he, he, that's he, he, dad, every time I come home. He's like, okay, Ron, I got another clinic coming up. Is there anything you want me to tell these kids to do for you? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, like, is there an, what, what Instagram should they follow? Like, he like wants a list. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah, like amazing, super, though. yeah. He's super into the thing. And he'll call me on the way home and be like, Ryan, three people came up to me and asked me for a picture. I'm like, yeah, that's Amazing. killing, Dad. He's like, yeah, man. I'd say, it's like I'm Ryan Devlin's dad now. And I'm like, well, you're always dad to me, you know? What yeah, I mean, yeah. but he loves it. He like. He basks in it. He loves oh. that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And that guy Valentin, or mm-hmm. uh, that oh, we, yeah, yeah. he had come uh, uh, do the thing at in Orlando, like a master class. Like mm-hmm. they did a video together. Oh yeah. Like base sack. Yeah. yeah. Dude, and so millions. people were uh, uh, the other weekend. Like people were coming up to him and asking for pictures. Really? Like he was playing a gig at Sea World, <laughs> oh, <laughs> all okay. places. Nice. And like I was there watching, and this kid came up and was like. I saw you on Instagram playing with Valentine. Are you the guy playing bass? That you know, he oh, like no fan. Way. Yeah, yeah. Oh. My dad was. I was so cool to see my dad like get recognized like that. It was oh, he loves amazing. it? He yeah. loves. He loves <laughs> that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So cool. But that's great. Some hobbies, good stuff. It's always good to have do do other things. Oh you know? yeah. No. Yeah. And have I think it's important too to like have people to talk to outside of music. Oh like, man. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, I talked to a lot of people. We you know we they don't play music music at all and it's it's great to just talk about other things yeah do other things to, to really get away from it mm. um we can get too close to this stuff sometimes sure you get in your own head you i mean oh my you god know, mentally it's tough sometimes when you're you know you you play a gig and then you have to edit the thing and then you're thinking about your music and you're listening to yourself play on the video over and then it's like it's this horrible feedback loop and you need to get out of it and mm. then you come back with like ah oh, fresh perspective Mm. Yeah, like you said, get some sun, get some fresh air. Sure. Like, I feel like I play better when I come from, like, I put on a new read. I'm like, oh, I haven't played in a little while. I'm like fresh. Mentally, I'm fresher. I feel physically I'm fresher because you're not just beating the same patterns into your fingers Mm. over and over again. Sometimes the best practice is no practice. Exactly. People say like, so I have to go on a weekend vacation and I can't bring my (laughs) saxophone. What do I do? I say, enjoy the vacation. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. You know, practice makes permanent. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So Mm. if you are practicing the same thing all the time, all the time, all the time, I was like people in college, I knew someone who would practice eight hours a day for like all four years. And that's like, you know, everybody gets in the shed at some point. But the problem was, and he would like shame people for not practicing as much. And like me and my friend were like at the gym and we're like playing Call of Duty and just like, you know, (laughs) doing whatever other nefarious activities, I guess. But we, uh, the problem was he would then sound like he, when he plays a gig, he sounds like he's in the practice room still because there's no divide of practice, 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 record, practice, 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 gig, practice, practice. It all just becomes the same thing and there's no Mm -hmm. disconnect and there's no performance aspect. If you practice eight hours a day for five days say it's a 40 hour work week 40 hour practice week you play a one hour gig are you going to magically now be super musical in that one hour or are you going to play like the other 40 hours you just played mm-hmm. that the, the numbers you know practice makes permanent yeah the numbers just you know when i started touring on a regular like my playing i feel like changed way more than when i was in undergrad practicing like six hours a day or whatever you think you differently know? you're not thinking about the the lick the line the core tone right. you're thinking about the interaction you're thinking about I always call it the non-note musical elements. You're thinking yeah, about you phrasing. You're can't thinking practice about, that with a neighbor soul track. No, you can't. No, do or it. iReal Pro. Hmm. Um, you know, it's great. It's a great tool, but it's just a tool. Before we get into the question part, yeah, yeah. I want to talk to you about this because you're a big jazz educator in the world now. I went to a master class at the Mingus Festival with this high school band that I uh, teach at, and uh, Abraham Burton's great. A fantastic tenor saxophone player grew up in New York in the village. So like, you know, in in the uh, 70s and 80s, like he was in New York with Art Blakey and Elvin and, you know, uh, Art Taylor and all these guys. Mm -hmm. And he said that one thing that is different. One big thing is when people were playing back then, it was a privilege to play jazz Mm -hmm. and there was a respect. Right. And he goes, everybody now is like entitled. Mm -hmm. And he goes, it's not like He's like, we don't want to gatekeep anything. We want everybody to play and everybody to be, you know, welcomed to play this music. But sometimes there's a lack of respect when people play the music. Like, like you know, when people go up at jam sessions and play like 13 choruses, you know, mm-hmm. of and it's like kind of the same thing. You know what I mean? It's like, what is actually he playing? You know, he or she playing? And it's like he said back then, like 
when he was growing up, like you would go up and if you didn't have, you know, you would, you would play this stuff, whatever. And if you were not making it happen, like someone would yell at you to mm. get off the stage. You mm. know what I mean? And like, and it was a respect thing, you know, like he's like, these people before you that laid this foundation didn't like, they died for this stuff. You know what I mean? And people sometimes forget about that. And it's like the, what's the line? We were talking about this at the educators meeting at the Mingus festival too. It's like, what's the line of respecting the music and, and being, you know, uh, being privileged to play it, but at the same time making people feel welcome to come up and play and not feel like they're like handcuffed and like it's not a uh, like it, it's scary to be a jazz musician. Like hmm. maybe what's your opinion on that uh, that kind of aspect of learning this hmm. music? Hmm. That's a tough question. Yeah, uh, I don't think anybody has an answer for it, but I'm yeah. just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hmm. I I I think uh, humility goes a long way. Um, I, I remember if there's a jam session at one of the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festivals. Um, and there was one guy, he sort of hogged the stage for a long time. And you just tell he loved hearing himself play. Yeah. And then after, um, he didn't make eye contact with anyone. And he would just, you could just tell the ego was all, you just smell it, you know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's all self-accountability. Um, I know at Smalls, right, I think they still have that culture. Yeah. That sort of. Yeah, I, I definitely think it can tip too far on that that side as well, or maybe the vibe culture will intimidate right. anyone to even play at all. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. I'm not sure the best answer. I, I guess if I think how how would I fit in that picture is am I being the best I can be? Right. Because that's I can only control myself. Yeah, I know? think that what it boils down mm -hmm. to is like having people like you that have a huge audience and a big influence, like showing people that. Like the humility, like like being aware, right? Mm -hmm. Of and I think that's what the best teachers have done for me is being aware of certain things, mm -hmm. like being aware that I'm playing too many choruses, being aware that I'm like just wanting to hear myself yeah. on stage. You know sure. what I mean? And like, yeah, because you might not be doing it on purpose. No, and that's it, the thing; people yeah, don't know. But but you don't know what you don't know, so it's good mm -hmm. to have mentors to kind of help. Because you, you out. get some educators yep. <laughs> that I that I know, unfortunately, that go up there and they do that because yeah. they don't know. You know what I mean? And, and if then, they're if they're doing it, that means they didn't have a mentor. No. That means they're probably not teaching it to the next people. Right. Mm. I think the big thing is when you talk about humility is when we step on stage, we're we're responsible for continuing the music and creating the like f giving contributing to the music. Yes. Mm. You know, it's not let me get on stage and now I'm this. No. It's we are this. How can I contribute the best? It might be taking a little bit of a longer solo. It sure. might be taking no solo. It might be I, you know, I don't know exactly, but but I think I always tell, you know, students and, and anybody who gets up on stage is think about like, think about if you were in the audience, what would be the best choice for the band to make? And then now you have to just fit into that. If that's you just sit off to the side and comp a little bit because that's what's best. It's nothing. It's not a dig on you. No. They talk about the best musicians are the ones who know when not to play. Yeah. Right. And it's I think that's super important. Yeah. And everything you do should serve the music and serve the situation, too. It's a hard lesson to learn, though. It's very hard because we go in the practice room thinking, I yeah. want to learn how to solo, and I have all these these licks and these lines, and I have this and that. But when you get on stage, the most – like Charlie Parker said, master your instrument practice and then go on stage and forget it. People always forget about the first part, too, the mastering yeah. your instrument part. They think you can just not do anything. But the point he's making is yeah. when you're on stage, it should be unconscious decisions of mm -hmm. musicality, when to play, when not to play, how long to play. And I think you need to – be conscious first. I always talk about when you're a baby, you have to be conscious of walking. You're not inherently know how to walk. Mm -hmm. But if I ask you to walk across the room right now, you're not going to think about the angle of your knees. You're just going right. to get up and walk. Mm -hmm. So it's if it's if you're on stage for the first time, somebody needs to tell you, yeah. hey, by the way, yeah. when when the, their band is playing and you don't know the melody, don't practice it out loud off to the side. Yeah, That's yeah. not, you know, professional. Oh, I didn't know I shouldn't do that. Okay. Again, it can go back to the Instagram thing or the highlight reel of like all people see are these like one minute absolute yep. shredding and then that person going up on stage is waiting for that moment to yes. happen and they could be like on the 17th chorus yep. of Mr. PC <laughs> and like you know and it's like you know everybody's sitting there like and then that yeah. puts a you know that puts something on that person now if a professional musician's in the audience like oh that's the kid that takes too many choruses yep. I'm mm -hmm. not going to call him for the gig oh, sure. you know what I mean like I've seen that happen another man another thing about that is and I'm a big believer in this and I talk to you about this is I think people if you want to eventually perform you need to stop doing a hundred takes at home before yeah. you post something online yeah. because when you perform 
as you know, if you've ever performed, we all know this, you get one shot. Mm -hmm. If you always give yourself the safety net of like, all right, I'm gonna set up my phone, I'm gonna take 40 takes and use yeah. the back, I'm gonna tweak this note, I'm gonna start it like this. You, you One, you get into your own head. Yeah. And on take three, you think about how you did take two and one. Mm -hmm. And you start, okay, I like the way I started it, but maybe this time I'll, and you have that safety net of, I can always hit re-record. You're at home by yourself, we're all home during COVID, we're all doing those virtual recordings, you do 50 takes, you get up on stage, and then you're either in your head trying to play like you did when you practiced, or you just completely fold yeah. and then realize, oh, I don't have a second op, I don't have a second take. Yeah. Mm. Right. So I think people need to like, and that goes back to like, what is best for the music is not necessarily practicing, uh, memorizing a solo and trying to get that Instagram highlight. It's let me just play and react. I need to be able to react unconsciously to what's happening behind yeah. me, musically, the audience reacting, the yeah. time, everybody, everybody has an obligation to what they're doing in, in the music. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still navigating, um, you know, because maybe this is a generational thing or maybe an uh, environmental thing. But uh, for a while, I, I would take uh, sort of maybe like a vibe culture or constructive criticism and I would per perceive it as an insult and feel mm. like intense negative feelings. Mm. And it, it would make me not want to do that again right. um, or be in that environment. But I think what's so important is a lot of this music came from that culture. Yeah. And so if you can, like, look through what you perceive to be an insult and see, like, why did they say it and see the constructive criticism, um, that's those those things that give you those feelings can often be the things that make you grow the most. Absolutely, you know? dude. And so I think, um, you know, being able to distinguish between between maybe a constructive insult or vibe and just a plain hater, someone that just wants to see you go down. Yeah. Um, but those are pretty rare, you know, yeah. I, I would say. Um, but, you know, if there is one and it's very clear that that's what they are, just disregard and just, like, ignore them. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think there's definitely some utility in a, in a vibe culture. And if, if you know how to find the gym inside... They, they can be the things that really grow your musicianship for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was on tour with, I was lucky enough to go on tour with Adam Nussbaum for, for like a month, five weeks. And, uh, one of our shows in Chicago, we were all really tired. Like we got right off the plane and had to go play a show. Like our flight was delayed. It was a whole thing. And after the first set, you know, we were playing for a completely sold out venue. Like it was, it was a great night. I was feeling cool, you know? And, I get kind of go back to get some food and he's there and he grabs me by the arm and goes, I'm going to say an expletive just for the historical value. He goes, stop making me feel like I'm a fucking Abersold track. Oh, wow. Because yeah, I was I was just sitting up there playing a bunch of what I thought, you know what I mean? Just like only a couple years ago. Wow. And uh, that I, immediately I was like, you know, this old man's just trying, you know, this is my gig. Da, da. Yeah, I'm like, what oh, the, yeah. why is he saying this to me? You know, I hired him. Like, mm. But... I realized after calming down for a second, you know, mm -hmm. that he wouldn't have said that to me if he didn't think I could be better or if he didn't care, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, sure. he's going to check at, after these gigs, mm -hmm. no matter what, if, if he says something to me or not, mm -hmm. you know? But he got, he like got really aggressive with me and like said it to my face. And that was one of the moments where I realized, like, man, like, I am, I, I'm not thinking about the music. I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. these licks. I'm thinking about, you know, the Instagram, you know? And that was a wake up call. But it took me a minute to like realize it was constructive criticism and not just him being a jerk. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And uh, but those are the moments that we grow from. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. It's like a a lot of really useful information really packaged and condensed into an insult. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have to like unwrap it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Yeah, bro. Oh, cool. Wanna go to some questions? Yeah. This is from great. our live studio audience. Absolutely. After so, uh, the college music. Awesome. Who's up first? Come on up. Come on up. First victim. <laughs> That's a dope sweater. State your name, date of birth. Oh, that's a nice sweater. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Cyrus. Um, I'm a bass player, just for context. Cool. Um, so I was going to ask a question also, like, I, on behalf of, like, students for sure, because I think they, we could all get something out of this. But, like, I wanted to talk about, like, balance and prioritization. Like, so balancing, like, I know you went to Frost, so... Mm -hmm. You know, and wherever you guys went to school, this could be for any of you. But like, you know, uh, when you have like a lot of things that you're trying to balance, like, in, you know, essays or 
just stuff that you might not see as important for what you're trying to do and how you go about balancing that with like taking stuff that you really feel like is going to progress you but knowing also that like you have to do these other things in order to ultimately do it and that's also where like prioritizing comes in where, where you have to like prioritize something mentally you know like because you know that this thing is what's gonna like what you said with chat or mm. like your experience with that yeah, yeah where you like had to prioritize that instead of your essay or something like that or like yeah. balancing youtube videos with going to school mm -hmm. and like which one was more important for you just stuff like that yeah absolutely um so i i sort of feel like it to keep something up to quality is for me it's always been as long as you do it every day so I've never really been the type to, you know, only do this, neglect everything else. Only do this, neglect. I'll sort of, um, you you play Clash Royale? Uh, no, a lot of my friends do. Oh, okay. Well, to upgrade, when you get cards or when you're opening chests, you're getting a different card for generally everything. You're never just getting all your chests for one card, and then that gets maxed out. Everything's level zero. You're like, okay, which is the next card? Just everything gradually goes up. Now my full, now my account's fully maxed out. You know, so, <laughs> but anyway, um, I sort of, I do sort of have a hierarchy. Like, what are the things that most matter? What are the things that should be of a great quality? In in my view, and then what are the things that I do need to get done? But I wouldn't be that upset if it's like I had to sacrifice some quality. That would be like my essays. Like all my essays, I always did the night before. I don't know if I would <laughs> preach anyone to do that, but even like my twenty-page finals master's paper, maybe I shouldn't reveal that. But I'm not. I'm not releasing it, so I don't really care. Mm. <laughs> um, um, so that's one thing. Um, but that's a whole nother can of worms because the procrastination it does keep you up at night, and I've lost a lot of sleep. I don't recommend that. Now I've all night, it really doesn't feel great. And I wonder if I took some years off my life expectancy, <laughs> but um, we'll we'll see that we'll see, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, yeah, and then there's just the other things where it's totally fine that I don't do well. Like example would be like I never really got that good at at pop at pop gigs. So whenever I got called for a pop gig, I'm like, well, it's probably gonna be pretty bad. But I just went, I showed up, still played. Like, yeah, that was pretty bad. And I just <laughs> went home. I'd, I'd, it's just never really a priority to me. Um, so I guess sort of n looking inside and asking yourself, what is most important to you? What do you want to hold to a high standard? Um, for me, I've, uh, whenever it was time to post a video, it's going to be there forever. I did want to, I did treat it like it was a baby. Like I've given my best effort uh, with the resources and knowledge I had at a time every single time and then my grades I've never really been a four point uh, like a four perfect gpa guy it was like as long as i can keep the scholarship that's all i really care about you know uh, but you know i had a friend jesse shelton he was really good at balancing everything he would get up at 6 a.m every day all a's all the time practice four hours a day some people are like that um i wish i was like that i tried to be like that but, um, you know, I play Smash Bros too much or something, <laughs> um, honestly, you know. So I guess that's my answer. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, the only thing I will say is, like, if you, like what what you said, if, if you love something, you make time for it, mm. you know. And, and uh, I did the school thing, too. I was similar in procrastination styles of, like, writing the essays mm. not with too much time, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, like my wife, man, she's out, like the minute she gets an assignment, she outlines like what she has to do. Like she has all this thing. She gets everything done like a week before the assignment. And I just can't, I can't do that either. Like, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I think prior, prioritizing what you love, uh, also keeps you happier. I think too. True. You know, like in school sometimes, I mean, even in grad school, I was like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to write these essays. I just want to go out and play and, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, getting a degree is definitely a, uh, a good investment in ourselves and everything. But yeah, I mean, yeah. prioritizing what you love, I think will make you happier. Yeah. And whether that's school related or not school related, you know, yeah. that's my thing. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all that stuff, but also I'm going to spin it a little differently. I think having to do different things now that you don't want to do uh, in college is important because in life, no matter what your job is, you're going to have to do things that isn't, isn't your favorite thing. Like there, even if you love playing gigs, you have to deal with, 
getting a van and dealing with booking agents and yeah. doing this and dealing with people and dealing with money and dealing with taxes and dealing with transportation. So you're going to have to deal with um, aspects of life that you don't want to That's sometimes. True. So I think it's important to not to, to make sure you, you, you do the things that you love and you do prioritize. Not everything could be a hundred percent. You don't have the bandwidth for that once again, yeah. but you need to realize that like, Oh, I don't, I'm just going to like fail out of this. I'm not going to do this. What happens when you have to do, Hey, we, we're going to sign you to play this gig, but also you have to show up and do these master classes and meet and greets. And you're like, that's eight in the morning. I don't wake up at eight. You got to do it. So yeah. I think it is good now because if you fail a college class or get a D on a paper, that's a lot less damaging to your career than missing a gig. Like I had a vocalist one time. I hired her for the first time. She was younger. I hired her and downbeat was seven o'clock. She texts me. She's like, I'm running a little late. I'll be there by like six. I told her to be there 6.15 to run stuff. She showed up at 7.15. Mm. I never called her again. Yeah. And when people ask for a, a vocalist, I never recommend her. So- you know, and that's real life because there's there's a hundred other vocalists that I know that can do just as good of a job. The best ability is availability. So you have to do certain things. You have to do certain things you don't want to do. And I think it's good to learn how to deal with that or, you know, learn to prioritize things like how do you make a video when you've been teaching all day, but then you have a gig at night, but then you have a vacation and you have, the, you know, you have to learn to deal. You can't just say like, I'm just not going to deal with it. I'm in my zone for the next eight hours. I'm just going to be practicing like real life doesn't allow you to do no. that. Outside of college, you might, you know, you got to do a million things. So I think it's good to learn to be able to compartmentalize things and prioritize certain things without neglecting certain things, you know? So yeah, there Thanks, you go. Charlie. Yeah. Awesome. Great question though. Yeah. Really? Man. Yeah. Man. Who's next? <laughs> and it doesn't have to be a real insightful oh. question. It could be like, yo, like how tall are you or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask us anything. <laughs> While I'm sitting down and the cameras are still on, I'm like six, three. Dang. <laughs> Chad. Killing. Yo, yeah, Chad's a giraffe. <laughs> when I first met him when I was in high school, I was like, Move. oh my God, they make people that big? That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's great. All right, what's up? What's your name? Uh, my name is Sultan. I'm second semester of Berkeley. Okay. And, uh, but first, I want, to, uh, I want to say thank you to uh, all of you guys uh, for this opportunity to listen, uh, to watch this uh, podcast in live. And thank you for you, especially Nathan, for coming. And uh, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to uh, say thank you to you because I I used to be a classical saxophone player, and and I used to study in, in my uh, in my high school. I studied in Moscow, and oh, wow. in uh, as a classical saxophone player. Oh, wow. And um, so everybody around me, like uh, classical players, they told me, like uh, you can't uh, you can't do both, mm -hmm. like classical and jazz. But I really wanted to play uh, jazz uh, uh, when I was in, uh, when I was in Moscow, and I uh, was really scared to to play it. But uh, your videos, your first videos, I, I watched it, and it was really uh, motivational. You're a really good example for me uh, that um, people can play um, both both genres. And now uh, maybe because of you, uh, I, I'm here now in Berkeley. Oh man! Yeah. Hey, so thank you for it. I have goosebumps. <laughs> wow! Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Woo That's so good. That's amazing. Uh -huh. thank you. Look at that. Look wow. at that reach. Wow. And uh, my question is, um, so can how can you imagine your life after ten years, for example? What's your main goal, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Ah, oh, gosh. I, sorry, I, I wish I had a, a good answer. I think um, I like the idea of not knowing what my future is going to be. I, I love, I'm love. i all of the philosophy of uh, riding the wave, um, but I also know the, the dangers of that. If you have no bullseye, where are you going to go? Mm. Um, but in 10 years, I hope, I hope, honestly, my biggest goal in life this might be a boring answer, just have a family, you know, um, and I hope I can provide for them. Mm. Um, but I hope uh, everything, yes, and my projects with my brother, I hope that can really become something bigger and bigger through time. Um, e I mean, even where I am now, I would have never imagined that I would be here. I sort of feel like whatever expectation I create, life shows me something better. So I've sort of just surrendered and just uh, just given my best every day and just have faith that everything um, will take care of itself because that it seems to be exactly how it happened. Um, 
but I hope that's a good answer. You know, maybe maybe it's disappointing. But, yeah, man. But and thank you, thank you for telling me all about that, man. That, that means a lot. And I, my teachers, they always harped on. He said, uh, the reason why uh, one, the reason why someone can't play the other genre is because they're not playing the other genre. That if you want to be good at both genres, you just have to be. You just have to play both genres every day. But it does mean double the practice load. So that's a sacrifice a lot of people aren't willing to make. Um, and I would say now, honestly, I, ever since I got out of school, I haven't really played uh, classical saxophone uh, very often. I did have to do a classical uh, master class, so I, I, I whipped it back out then. But I think um, probably at some point I might denounce that I've probably uh, done playing classical saxophone. But I love it, and I forever respect it. And... Uh, maybe I'll even compose for it uh, here and there. Maybe some etudes. I've always wanted to make my own furling etude book, but yeah. uh, Saxologic etude, which is very classical and technique oriented, just because I, I loved playing through those things growing up. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, great. Thank dude. you, man. Awesome. Yeah, yeah uh, 10 years, man. <sighs> Uh, I hope to be a professor somewhere. I would love to be a professor. At New England Conservatory or would probably be my top choice because that's where I went to school, you know, for grad school. So in 10 years, if I'm, uh, you know, doing what Jerry Berganzi is doing, that would be a goal. <laughs> mm. And then also, yeah, having a family for sure. Oh, yeah. You know, I just got married and uh, that's kind of like a first step into that. Married man. Yes, married man. Uh, and so having a family someday, I think is super important to me. And uh, just being able to provide, you know, uh, as a musician for my family is 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 a goal abs- as well. So hopefully, just kind of doing what I'm doing now, being able to tour and 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 play with different bands, but also uh, being a professor at a conservatory. Awesome. Love that, Professor Devlin. Yeah, <laughs> prof. I'll ten buy. years. <laughs> I'll finish my DMA at your school. Yeah. Oh, dude! <laughs> oh my God, that'd be amazing. <laughs> <It'd> be <laughs> so much fun. Ten years, man. How old will you be in 10 years? I, it, don't worry about it. Okay. How old I'll be. Um, 10 years older than I am now. Oh, okay. I'll still look the same. But uh, That's good. I used to make five-year plans with my friends. Like mm-hmm. my one friend specifically, actually. We used to have three five-year plans. Mm. And none of them ever... Oh, wow. None of them ever were this... Ever, like, came to what we thought about. Good or good and bad, like, just mm. in general. So, you know, I, I try not to, like you were saying. I kind of go with it. Mm. Um, and I try to work on what's right in front of me. Mm. And I know that can lead certain mm-hmm. place but I, you know i think long term um you know i started my online business thing actually like actually the online business thing a couple years two years ago now a little under two years ago so i want to really build that up big um if that could be i mean by 10 years from now if that's just the full-time thing um for me that'd be great because it affords me then that lifestyle to um be where i want and do those other life things that i want that uh, can't don't keep me in this box here, and I can take other opportunities that I can't do now, um, and just you know be flexible with certain things. With my wife, she's a scientist, but she's at home a lot, um, working from home. So it'd be great if I was home, yeah, you know, during those times and stuff too, because um, that's a big part of things for me. I don't need to go out and do lots of things. I'd like to be home. I'm a home body, <laughs> 100%. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm able to do that um, with other things, letting me afford to be able to do that would be great. So. Yeah, just build the build my online uh, business there. Heck yeah. All right, who's next? <laughs> what we got? Great. Come on up. Hello, I'm Monique. Um, I play saxophone. And you've kind of been, like, walking around this question a lot, but has there ever been, like, a point in your career or life where you felt like the sacrifices you were making for music was, like, overwhelming? That sort of, like, lifestyle you're going after or, like, you know, because, like, when you're going through school, you you can't, like, have those high career positions quite yet, but you're still paying rent and, like, doing mm. all this. So just, like, if there's been a point for you like that in your life and how you nav- have navigated it. Yeah. That's a great question. Can I answer that first? Yeah, yeah. Because there was a there was a 100% a point where I thought I was going to have a breakdown um, in college when I was a so- uh, sophomore, sophomore, junior it, it around there. I was a jazz performance major at William Patterson University. <laughs> Shout out Willie P. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm I'm into the thing, and I'm like, I'm gonna be a professional musician. I'm gonna be gigging every day, and this is what I'm gonna do. That's all I wanted to do in high school. Practice all the time. This is what I'm gonna do. And then I started 
once again, this goes back to, I didn't, you know, you don't see this stuff on Instagram, didn't exist, so I didn't really know what it was like. And I started to talk to people about what life is like outside of college and what was life like afterwards. And I was making the sacrifice of like, I wasn't doing anything else. I was practicing all the time, going all this stuff. And I started thinking about like, what it, what is actually going to happen? I'm going to be really good at playing all these these standards and I'm going to leave school and then what, right? And I was like, I, I remember it was whatever one of that semester, maybe my first semester, junior year, second semester, sophomore year, I was like losing my mind. And I was on my fr- phone with my friend Jeff, uh, Jeff Reed, the alto player, like every day I was calling him. I was like freaking out about this, freaking out about that, talking, um, you know, about this and that. And just like, what am I going to do? What What's this? Why is the sacrifice of all this going to be worth it? Like I was picturing what I wanted in my mind um, as the career or as my life. And, and I made that decision to go, okay, I remember I was talking to Dave Dempsey, who was the, the, the leader of the jazz program there. And I, we had a really good conversation of like, I told him how I was feeling. And then he started leading me into a path of talking about, well, have you ever thought about being a teacher? And I said, I don't know if I ever told you this. The one thing I said when I graduated high school, I told all my teachers, I said, the number one thing I'm never going to be is a teacher. That's what I said, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, see how that goes, right? Well, when you're 18, you know everything, remember. So, sure. <laughs> right. so but I, yeah, so I, th- I, there was a moment where I made a pivot and I said, and it was a hard thing to do because in my mind, I felt like I was giving up. But all I did was go from jazz performance to jazz performance slash music ed. Like nothing really changed except for I got a lot of other classes added to my schedule. So there's a different sacrifice of like I had way more classes. I had to do less of certain things, but I felt better because I was like, okay, now I feel like there's some like light at the end of the tunnel almost type of feeling of I knew that things now I'm not going to be as that anxious feeling of what's going to happen, what's going to happen. I'm like, okay, now there's maybe more options. And that's not Mm -hmm. for everybody, but me personally, there was that moment of like, Man, what wh- where is this all going? I, you know, Gary Smalley making me learn tunes in twelve keys every week is great, but like, I really started thinking of like, I'm killing myself for this jury, and I'm killing myself writing these tunes. I'm killing, I'm like, what is going to happen? Because it's not like while I was doing this, I was getting a million gigs, right? right. You know, I was sitting in with the Mingus band, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world, and it still it was really cool. But it wasn't like Sue was calling me up to to play every right, week, and I was right. like, okay, so that's great. I did all this for this little thing and this, you know, little pieces here and there, but. I felt like I had to make a pivot, and I did. Yeah, and that's not for everybody, but that's that's where I felt like the the sacrifice wasn't worth it for me in that sense. Yeah, so I don't know how you guys feel about that. Yeah, I, I had a, a kind of a quarter life crisis when I was twenty five. I'm twenty seven now, and uh, where I was like, I'm you know I just started touring and uh, I was teaching online, but I was losing money on every single time I'd go out of town. You know, I was basically paying my way to all these places to get more opportunities. I had just moved in with my girlfriend at the time we weren't even engaged yet and i was basically like begging my dad for money <laughs> every month mm-hmm. to make my rent and i was like what am i doing like seriously you know I'm, I'm trying to go to any i'm finishing up my degree at nec but what does this look like mm-hmm. you know what i mean like i was teaching uh, with jazz lesson videos a little bit teaching private lessons and just trying to i was like reaching for this thing and it was just it was feeling like it was getting further away than me being able to actually grasp it and uh I remember, like, what am I going to, like, I considered dropping out of school. I considered not even playing pre- music professionally. I considered being a golfer. <laughs> you know, like, I considered a lot of different things. And uh, I remember talking to my now wife about it, and she's like, you know, I think you're just in this period of, like, you're realizing that all of this stuff outside of your music school bubble is important, right? Mm-hmm. Paying rent is important. Not asking your parents for money all the time is important. Mm-hmm. Having your own life separate from all that. And I remember you know, talking to other mentors about it. I talked to Berganzi about it. I talked to Chad a little bit about it. I talked to my dad about, you know, all these professional musicians in my life. And they're just like, it's kind of a waiting game in a way of like waiting for that one opportunity to help launch you into that new part of your life where, you know, now you're like out of school and then being a professional. Like, I'll I'll be honest, like, I mean, I think a little bit less than a year ago was like the first time I could pay my own rent and pay all of my own bills without my dad's help. Like maybe like five, six months ago, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I'm older. And yes, I'm living in Boston. It might be a little bit more expensive than other places to live and all this stuff. But like, that was the first time and I saw it, you know, but it was because I got this teaching job at Newton and I worked for Jazz Lesson Video. And I, it's all of these things that are combined, you know, but I had to make those sacrifices all the way up until I was like 26, you know, just grinding and asking, you know, doing these opportunities, investing in myself a lot before it finally, I could like kind of see this little light, you know, it's like, 
okay, now I can kind of see how I could do this maybe for the rest of my life and have these different opportunities to do uh, music professionally. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel you because it's a grind. And in, in college, you know, having to say no to gigs because you have class and like all these things, like you have to kind of outweigh that. And some professors, I think, will say, oh, do the gig. You know, I know that you need to, you know, I know you need to be in class, but that's super important. Other professors will say the opposite. Uh, so I think it's like a balancing act in that aspect. But just know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I think it'll be, <laughs> it'll be worth it. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Uh, Chad was calling. Oh, really? Yeah, You'll I, answer, I'll it. answer it later. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I sort of feel like I've sort of been through the in the inverted problem where um, very, very early, uh, like while I was in high school, I'd learned uh, that being a musician doesn't make much money, or that's what they would say. You know, they'd be like, oh, you're doing a music major? Oh, you just, you, you probably just really love it, huh? Like, what does that mean? It's like, oh, well, you're not, you're never going to be rich. And as someone, when I was younger, I always made like these really big dreams. Like I want to be a doctor and anything that made a lot of money, basically. Uh, I guess that's maybe I was shallow, a little kid or something, but um, either that or um, I really want to be a CGI animator for like Transformers because <laughs> they made, you know, millions. It's like, I want to do that. And so when I fell in love with saxophone, I was like, okay, I want to do this instead. Uh, what are the career options? And everyone says, if you're a gigging musician, you'll be poor. And so that that uh, sort of intimidated me very early. And when I did my first gig, I mean, like $50, I was like, wow, I see what they mean. Like, if, if this is my life. And so uh, I think I really became attracted to YouTube when I saw this video. I mean, uh, when I started it, uh, you couldn't even make money. And then the YouTube partnership program came on. And, you know, you would hear of these people that would make, you know, millions uh, or like six figure and I was like okay maybe that's just like a small percentage then I saw like a 12 year old uh, say I made $700 on YouTube today and to <laughs> me I was like I was like you're basically rich and um that then I became really I felt like okay if this 12 year old can make it maybe I can do it and make this video on how to put on your contacts and you know stuff like that um and then when things started doing really well I sort of felt like um monetarily I was doing great but my musicianship wasn't nearly as up to par as a lot of people I admired so I I really really carried this imposter syndrome and I felt this guilt I was like man I'm hearing these musicians 10 times better than me struggling and um and then not only that the YouTube stuff and all the career stuff really takes time and I sort of felt like the career takes away from my saxophone time. Mm -hmm. So I started resenting the career stuff. And so uh, I still pretty much battle that now. I mean, even even with this new job, I love it. Um, I think in 2025, maybe uh, Chad is so flexible, he's awesome. I, I think we're, we're gonna try something to where I can finally get my time back and really put it back into the saxophone as much as I want to, especially with this band going on i mean i i dream about like man what if i put all that time that i did into youtube what if i put it into my saxophone how much better would i be or all the time i spent playing super smash brother i have over ten thousand hours in smash it's pretty sad but that's i'm a lot of hours though. okay yeah okay. that's i mean hey man it's your hobby <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah same with clash <laughs> <laughs> round of applause for nathan oh, Grable, yeah. everybody oh, thank you Man, thank you. Thank you so much for being hey, here. Yeah. As always, yeah. oh, thank you. always a pleasure. So for all of you here, thank you for being here. Thanks thank for being here. Thank you to Berkeley. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, Dan, behind the camera. Omar, Dan, thank you to Boston Sack Shop. Another back roasters. And Ryan. And remember, the hang is more important than the gig. Thanks, guys. <laughs>